Hello Booktube, it's Joshua here, and uh, today I'm going to be doing the uh, Phenomenal Woman Book Tag. Uh, this tag was created by Marilyn Maya Mendoza uh, for her 74th birthday, I believe, and her uh, fourth year on Booktube. So congrats to you, uh, and thank you so much for creating this, uh, this book tag. I was tagged by uh, Book Chat with Pat, so thank you, Pat, uh, as always, for tagging me. Um, and question one is, who is your favorite phenomenal woman author? For that, I would say probably Jane Austen. Uh, I suppose it. I suppose this answer is kind of uh, a given because Jane Austen is so universally loved, and um, she's so delightful. Um, also, as I'm discovering with uh, Steve Donahue's read aloud on his channel, I'm discovering that she's also very, very, she's, she's very skilled and incredibly talented at, at shaping a narrative. And, um, and I think Steve is kind of highlighting that in his read aloud. And um, so I'm, I'm really enjoying that, that read aloud of Pride and Prejudice. I've only read uh, three of her novels. I've read Pride and Prejudice, Emma, and Northanger Abbey. So I still have a lot of her other novels to get to, which is uh, really exciting because um, who doesn't want to read more New Jane Austen? <laughs> so uh, yeah, th that's the, probably my answer to the first question. Number two, what book features your favorite phenomenal woman character? Uh, there are a lot of characters I could say for this. There are many that I think I've mentioned on this channel in the past. Uh, it, could, it could have been uh, Anne of Green Gables or, or Jane Eyre or uh, any Jane Austen heroine, but I think I'll say uh, uh, Tanar from the Earthsea books by Ursula K. Le Guin. Uh, she she's a character in well she first shows up as a character in the second novel of of this Earthsea series, um, and there she's she's a girl who has uh, who has been. Uh, brought up to be a kind of head priestess of a religion of, of, a, of, a, of a temple um, and, I, and I guess the story is partly her coming out of that and, and realizing that the religion is and realizing that that religion or that, that kind of cult uh, isn't what she thought it was and uh, kind of gaining the freedom to, th to think for herself um, and then she, sh and then she shows up again, I believe in the fourth novel, um, where she's much older and she's, uh, and she's, re she's really the main character of, of that novel. Whereas in the second novel, it's kind of shared between her and Ged. Um, but this time the, the, the spotlight is on her and well, throughout the series, she's just a wonderful character, a, re a really strong character. And, um, Yeah. That would be my choice for the for the the second question. Um, for question three, if you were if you were creating a book prize, which book by a phenomenal woman author would you choose? So for this one, um, I have multiple books to show you. Uh, first, I have let's see, I have Elizabeth Bishop's uh, Complete Poetry. I would nominate this one for a book prize. Uh, about a week ago, uh, John David, another booktuber, he, uh, saw that I was talking about a, uh, book by Langdon Hammer. It was a, a biography of James Merrill written by, by, by Hammer, who was a professor of Yale. And he told me about some lectures that, uh, Hammer had on YouTube. They were posted on the y Yale, on the Yale YouTube site. And uh, and there were some there were some lectures that Hammer delivered on, on on modern poetry, and one of the poets that he covered was Elizabeth Bishop. So I went and watched those lectures, and um, until then I didn't I didn't really get Elizabeth Bishop to be honest. I had tried to read her poems often, and they seemed to be too too ordinary, I guess. Uh, too. Well, I, I guess I thought that, that nothing happened or I didn't get the point of them. Uh, but those lectures really kind of illuminated uh, 
what Bishop was trying to do. And now I'm really starting to enjoy her poetry. Uh, so yeah, I just thought I'd mention Bishop. Uh, also, I just recently started reading uh, How I Grew by Mary, by Mary McCarthy. Uh, I, I, I saw in, one of, in uh, one of Hannah's videos that she was talking about Mary McCarthy. And I went and I, I sampled a, uh, on Kindle, I sampled, I read a sample of uh, McCarthy's novel, The Group, uh, and I thought it was amazing. And then I, and then later, a little bit later, I looked in my basement and I realized that I had this novel, I had this, uh, or not this novel, this memoir by Mary McCarthy. So I picked it up and started reading it because I was interested in reading something by McCarthy. Uh, and... It's been really good so far. I'm only on, I've only read the first chapter. Um, I'm only on page 30 or so, but it's been really fascinating. Um, really, this seems like just uh, a memoir, just a memoir just as much about books as about her own life. She, she talks, she talks, it's essentially a, a history of her, of her reading. That's pretty much all it is. Um, it's very book, book focused. Uh, which I which I like a lot, so I'm really enjoying it. Um, also, well, I wanted to mention Ursula K. Le Guin again. This is her collected poems, um, edited by Harold Bloom. And uh, yeah, I would definitely nominate Ursula K. Le Guin for a book prize. Uh, I mean, she clearly was a very uh, very prolific author and a very eclectic author because I think she wrote novels in both science fiction and fantasy as well as poetry um, and all of it from what I've seen so far is great. Uh, this is her complete poems and Harold Bloom writes an introduction here uh, and there's this one sentence that I that, that I like or that this one passage, passage that I like uh, that Harold Bloom writes in describing uh, Le Guin. In some ways, I find her indescribable. Politically, she was an anarchist, religiously a Taoist, socially a feminist beyond feminism, and one of the most eloquent prophets against our despoliation of air, water, earth, and its creatures, foliage, woodlands. Reading her, I almost learn how it is to be a tree. <laughs> So, so that, that's a that, 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 that there is a really uh, interesting passage by Bloom, and it 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 makes it makes me want to read more of the Gwyn. Um, that <laughs> that phrase, socially a feminist beyond feminism. I'm not, I don't I don't really know what that means, but it sounds interesting. So, uh, yeah, and you know what? I think I want to read you a uh, a poem by the Gwyn, and I'll just take a poem. I'll I'll. I'll read, I'll read you a poem that, that Harold Bloom uh, quotes in, in, in his introduction. It's called uh, Finding My Elegy. I can't find you where I've been looking for you, my elegy. There's all too many graveyards handy these days. Too many names to read through tears on long black walls. Too many bulldozed, bone-filled ditches. And all the animals to mourn wiped off the earth like mist wiped off a mirror, leaving one face, reflection of itself alone, image of its imagined image, nothing else, no grief, no dirt, no dogs, no elegies. That desert is no place for you. And so I looked where death is birth and gods are animals, and being flows through being, as from spring the stream flows to and through the rivers to the sea. But what's to mourn, if life betakes itself into another life? Better a rite of passage, painful, joyful celebration of the change, warning and welcome to the soul returned, forgetful who it was, and we not knowing either, seabird or child, salmon or fern or fawn, and on the eightfold way, although compassion finds itself at home, and all the hard work of sorrow dissolves to breathing in and out the lives let loose from turning 
turning, turning, gone nowhere to do no harm at last, after the long despair. So where to seek? I used to dream of climbing high in the hills, those silent ridges red with dawn, to find your sisters the laments. But that's a hero's journey. I am older than a hero ever gets. My search must be a watch, patiently sitting, looking out to the open door. Far off through shadow, I can see a woman who stands to speak a name, though I can't hear her voice across the ruins of the centuries. I know how hard it was to speak, how her throat ached. In Rome, beside the pyre or open grave, they'd say the name aloud three times and then be still. A name is hard to say. Who'd read aloud all those names on that long wall? What woman born could bear to know so many children dead? Numbers are easier. So the men of money say numbers, not names. Grief's not their business. But I think it may be mine. And if I have a people anymore, I will find them in tears. My elegy. Your clothes are out of fashion. I see you walking past me on a country road in a worn cloak. Your steps are slow, along a way that grows obscure as it, as it leads back and back. In dusk, some stars shine small and clear as tears on a dark face that is not human. I will follow you. So that was finding my elegy. Um, really wonderful, even though, even if I don't understand it entirely, um, I'm going to have to return to that, uh, in the future. And I might as well read you another poem by, by Bishop, since this video, uh, hasn't, hasn't been too long yet. So I'll, uh, okay, I'll, I'll read you, uh, this poem called The Weed by Elizabeth Bishop. I dreamed that dead and meditating, I lay upon a grave or bed, at least some cold and close-built bower. In the cold heart, its final thought stood frozen, drawn immense and clear, stiff and idle as I was there. And we remained unchanged together for a year, a minute, an hour. Suddenly there was a motion as startling there to every sense as an explosion. Then it dropped to an insistent, cautious creeping in the region of the heart, prodding me from desperate sleep. I raised my head. A slight young weed had pushed up through the heart and its green head was nodding on the breast. All this was in the dark. It grew an inch like a blade of grass. Next, one leaf shot out of its side, a twisting, waving flag, and then two leaves moved like a semaphore. The stem grew thick. The nervous roots reached to the side, reached to each side. The graceful head changed its position mysteriously, since there was neither sun nor moon to catch its young attention. The rooted heart began to change, not beat, and then it split apart and from it broke a flood of water. Two rivers glanced off from the sides, one to the right, one to the left, two rushing half-clear streams, the ribs made of them two cascades, which assuredly, smooth as glass, went off through the fine black grains of earth. The weed was almost swept away. It struggled with its leaves, lifting them fringed with heavy drops. A few drops fell upon my face and in my eyes, so I could see, or in that black place, thought I saw, that each drop contained a light, a small, illuminated scene. The weed-deflected stream was made itself of racing images as if a river should carry all the scenes that it had once reflected, shut in its waters, and not floating on momentary surfaces. The weed stood in the severed heart. 
What are you doing here? I asked. It lifted its head all dripping wet with my own thoughts and answered then. I grow, it said, but to divide your heart again. So there is, there is uh, the weed in a, I think slightly skewed reading, but oh well. Uh, and that's, well, that's, that, that's all I have for you today. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Pat, for tagging me. And thank you, Marilyn, for creating this awesome tag. And uh, I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, and thanks. Goodbye.